right, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'm really happy uh, that Whitney Harrington is able to give uh, the Jones Seminar today. Um, and so Whitney Harrington is an associate professor of pediatric infectious diseases um, and a PI for the Center for Global Infectious Disease Research at Seattle Children's. Um, she's also an affiliate investigator at the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Research Center and is an infectious disease physician at Seattle Children's Hospital. Her research is focused on maternal and fetal immunology and infection during pregnancy. Um, and in particular, she investigates the role of uh, maternal microchimerism um, uh, in fetal uh, and infant immunity to malaria, HIV, and early vaccination. Um, she has a BA in neurobiology from Harvard, uh, followed by a PhD in pathobiology, a pediatric residency, a pediatric infectious disease fellowship at the University of Washington Seattle Children's, and has a lot of really uh, awesome things to talk about today. So thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I always enjoy these meetings so much because I get to meet so many people, I hear about really interesting potential areas of synergy, and I hope that I incorporated many of those aspects um, quite unintentionally in this talk in terms of the many things um, that all of you are working on here. I think my training is very much in infectious disease and host pathogen interactions, and as I've moved through my career, I've become more and more focused on basic human immunology. So that's most of what I'm going to talk about today. I am not a certified immunologist. I'm an accidental immunologist. So I hope that I um, have really couched this in a way that feels accessible to everyone, and I'll try to not make it too deep into the immunologic weeds, um, and, and hopefully it will be accessible. Um, I also love it when people interrupt and ask questions, so please feel free to do that um, throughout the talk. I think the other thing that I like to mention just, and, and I've tried to construct this really as a scientific journey, so I'm delighted that there are so many students here because I think that um, you are often surprised in science, and it's really one of the things that keeps science interesting and fresh is the ability to follow that journey. Um, the other brief caveat I would just say is I'm trying to be very precise in the language that I use, so I'll talk about um, the cervical vagina, I try to talk about pregnant individuals and lactating individuals, so um, hopefully that uh, will, uh, will be inclusive, and um, if I slip up, uh, please forgive me. So uh, the project I want to tell you about is a completely new project to my lab in the last year, which makes it the most exciting and the most dynamic of what we're working on. It also means that I would love feedback and suggestions on the project in terms of questions you have, directions you think this could move. Um, criti criticisms are delightful because we're submitting the paper next week, so I would love to get them now as I get all of your feedback. Do you need to be able to change slides? So just to begin, I think in this question about how I got here, my lab is really focused on maternal infections and how they impact fetal and infant immunity and my training is in malaria biology, and we've expanded into HIV. We think about CMV, we think about vaccine responses. But when I started this scientific journey now, almost 20 years ago as a graduate student, I was focused on malaria and pregnancy, and um, Plasmodium falciparum has a very unique property of infecting the placenta and causing a massive inflammatory infiltrate into the intervillous spaces of the placenta, which are these areas of maternal blood um, which are bathing the villi, which are the fetal structures in the placenta where the fetal blood vessels are. So this is an image where if you took a placenta and you cross-sectioned it and you were looking at this inflammatory infiltrate, all of these little dark dots are lymphocytes that have, lymphocytes and monocytes that have ended up in the intervillous space. So you, you can imagine that would have quite a substantial impact for both the mom and the fetus in this case. And there's a large literature around that intersection between the maternal infection and the fetal immunity. Um, as I was working on this project as a graduate student, I then went back to residency and fellowship, and I joined a lab that had focused on maternal microchimerism, which is the trafficking of maternal cells from the pregnant mom during the, preg during the mom from pregnancy across the placenta and into the fetus. And we have an accumulating literature that these maternal cells traffic all over the body and are um, identified as differentiated cells in many different organs. They're also present in cord blood and in infant peripheral blood, and they're um, in many different immune subsets. Um, and they end up in places that are very immunologically important, so things like the thymus and the peripheral blood. So my fellowship project was 
thinking about the implication of having this dig infection in the placenta on the trafficking of these maternal cells. And specifically, what kind of cells are trafficking? Does that impact um, uh, infant susceptibility to malaria? Now, one of the observations that we made in the context of all of the work around cord blood and thinking about the transfer of maternal cells um, into the fetus was that this maternal graft, at least in healthy U.S. cord bloods, is very enriched for memory T cells. So this is a study that Semi Kanan, who was a postdoc the same time I was in Lee's lab, um, we did uh, together in Lee's lab where we looked at the distribution of maternal cells across different compartments in the cord blood. And each of these circles is um, a healthy U.S. cord blood, and the size of the circle reflects the total maternal graft that that infant had or that fetus had, and then the distribution is represented. And hopefully you can see that um, the majority of cells that are trafficking are memory T cells, although there is a distribution of other cells present. Um, I think the other thing I, I always remark on is that this is doesn't look like a transfusion event. So we don't understand the mechanism by which these cells traffic across the placenta, but this is not a distribution that matches maternal blood. And the relative blood pressures in the intervillous space, which is the mom's blood and the fetal blood vessels, would always favor a fetal to maternal transfusion event. So anytime you get disruption of the placenta, you typically would see fetal blood entering the maternal circulation. So we think these T cells are actively trafficking into the, into the fetus. And we're really um, fascinated by this idea that um, a pregnant mom could be conveying a memory T cell graft to her offspring, which could have an unrecognized impact on uh, infant susceptibility. So after we had made these series of observations, we said, well, we know that um, placental infection in the context of malaria seems to be associated with more cell trafficking. Um, what about other infections like maternal HIV? where we know that maternal HIV is also associated with placental infection or placental inflammation. So we did a follow-up study, which was with my colleague and mentor um, and friend, Heather Jaspin, who's a terrific scientist um, in our group, where we enrolled a cohort of uh, South African infants who were HIV, some were HIV exposed, meaning the moms have HIV, and some were not, and um, asked what were the determinants of maternal microchimerism transfer in that cohort. We considered a bunch of different things. Um, we predicted that babies whose moms had HIV would have maternal, more maternal microchimerism. We were completely wrong. We were really wrong about every part of this project, which led to a lot of very interesting and unexpected observations. And one of the first things we noticed was um, that the level of microchimerism we were measuring across time was quite dynamic in terms of how many maternal cells were present in these infants. So we're looking at maternal cells per 100,000. So if you think about um, just your orders of magnitude, these babies up here in the peripheral blood at week 15 have 1% maternal cells circulating. Um, down here, this is about 0.1%. So this is very unexpected to us. First of all, the magnitude of chimerism that we were seeing at these late time points. Second of all, the dynamic nature of these, although we recognize that we've just intermittently sampled infants, so there could be a lot happening in between these time points. We then um, asked the question about maternal HIV and found something totally uh, different, which was that HIV was actually associated with less maternal microchimerism, and it mattered when the mom had been diagnosed in pregnancy. So if she were diagnosed prior to the pregnancy, had been on antiretroviral therapies, there was a partial restoration in the level of maternal microchimerism that was present in her offspring, whereas if the moms were diagnosed late in pregnancy, um, there was a substantial decrease in the total number of maternal cells that were transferred. So totally unexpected, and it got us really interested in T-cell biology. So I tell you this whole story to say I hadn't thought a lot about T-cells um, until I started working in this project and in this space and tried to start understanding, well, what are the determinants of T-cell transfer in the placenta? Um, really basic questions, like we know a lot about maternal antibody transfer across the placenta in the context of protection from the infant, and we know essentially nothing about the transfer of these cells. So we don't know when they cross. We don't know how diverse they are. We don't know what their antigen specificity is. We don't know if we can manipulate or predict them. So we started learning about T cells, and then we went back to the study again, and we said, what else can we learn from the study? And if you take that graph and you really um, compress it, what we found is that maternal microchimerism uh, was increasing across time. 
And that was also very surprising to us because we assumed that chimerism would be highest at the time of birth and then it would decay over the first year of life. And that's not what we were seeing. And in fact, what we were finding was that exclusive breastfeeding, which is this um, light blue dots right here, was strongly associated with level of microchimerism. So our exclusively breastfed babies had way more maternal cells circulating in their peripheral blood than our non-exclusively breastfed babies. So we said, why, why would that be? Can, can infants also accumulate cells from breastfeeding? And it turns out there's a large animal literature across really many different mammalian species that shows that there are a lot of T cells in breast milk that when pups nurse um, those on those dams, those T cells can survive the infant gastrointestinal tract. They can track across the GI epithelium and they end up in very interesting places like the liver and the lung. And then there are a couple of studies which show protection. So if you transfer an antigen specific T cell and then you challenge the pup with the same infection, those maternal T cells can protect the infant. So we thought, this is wild. This is really cool. It's never been shown in humans. We just have this epidemiologic association. It's a very hard problem to solve in humans. But let's start really um, at step one, which is what is in human breast milk? Like, what kind of T cells are there? So that's how we ended up in the breast. So we started in the placenta. We moved to the breast. And we said, what do we understand about breast milk biology? What do we know about T cells that are present in breast milk? And a lot of this literature comes from the HIV field again, where people were interested in maternal to child transmission of HIV. So there were some early studies in the 2000s looking at um, what kind of T cells were present in breast milk, what their antigen specificity was. Uh, but beyond that, not much had been done. So we thought, well, maybe there's something so different about breast milk T cells compared to peripheral blood that if we could go into the infant and pull out these maternal microchimeric cells, we would see two populations some that had come via the placenta and some that had come via breast milk. And maybe we could tell those apart by some intrinsic difference in the origin of the cells, meaning peripheral blood, transplacentally, and breast milk in terms of breast milk transferred cells. So the first question we had was, well, are breast milk T cells, are they actually coming from tissue? So are they tissue resonant T cells that are somehow able to get out into the lumen of the breast milk or are they actually just from the vessels, the blood vessels that are within the breast? And what we're seeing is micro trauma, particularly when we ask a mom to pump and give us breast milk. And so the, the T cells we find are just blood contamination. It's a pretty simple question. So we decided we were going to start studying breast milk T cells, which is how um, Dr. Goods and I were able to connect um, uh, in this field of breast milk biology. And this is an example of breast milk that we processed in our lab where we're looking at the cell pellet. So we've taken a whole breast milk, we've um, refrigerated it and spun it down, and you get this thick cream level, cream layer that you scrape off with a spatula. Then you have an aqueous phase that contains all of the antibodies, and then you have a big cell pellet at the bottom. So if anyone has ever worked with cells before, this is insane. This is an insane cell pellet. So typically, you can't even see the cell pellet, or it's pretty small when you're working with a sample, and this is gigantic. And that's because this is a lot of epithelial cells. And what I'm going to try to show you in this breast milk project is basically how we got to female genital tract and all of this parallel biology, which we're incredibly interested in understanding. So in the breast milk, when we started to phenotype the T cells that we got back, we found some very interesting things, like they were exclusively memory T cells. So if we're looking at effector memory and central memory, which are two different kinds of really important um, T cell populations in, in um, blood and in tissue, we found that breast milk CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells were essentially exclusively memory populations. So they were very much not the same as what was happening in peripheral blood. And that was true when we looked across a large number of women. More recently, we've also started to think about a, pop, a very special population of cells that's present in tissue, which is called tissue resident T cells. And these are an, a very potent effector population that stays in the tissue. So unlike T cells um, that can move and migrate between lymph node and peripheral blood and tissue, these tissue resident cells, once they get there, they really stay there. And then they're designed to be kind of the most potent effectors and first responders in a mucosal site. So when we went into breast milk, we found that there's a lot of tissue resident T cells there, uh, there as well, which we think means that what we're capturing in the breast milk is really representative of what's happening in the underlying tissue, in, in the biology of the breast around lactation. 
The other thing that we found about breast milk T cells was that they were enriched for these important mucosal markers like CCR9, which is a GI homing molecule, CD103, which is used as a tissue resident marker, but is also really important in lung biology, which we found very intriguing that these cells had this high expression of these mucosal homing markers. And um, would that, what does that mean that if they were uh, consumed by an infant and um, were able to survive the GI tract, that they would traffic to other mucosal sites in the, in the infant's body? So the last thing that we showed when we were thinking about breast milk biology was we wanted to understand um, how dynamic this site was. So could we predict the antigen specificity of the T cells we were isolating? And is it possible to modulate the kinds of T cells that are present in breast milk? So we did this study in the middle of the pandemic, and we had done a bunch of TCR sequencing, which I won't show you, that indicated that women who were mRNA vaccinated had spike-specific clones in their breast milk. So we thought, well, let's do a little small pilot study or a little nested pilot study where we ask women to come back before they get their third dose of COVID vaccine, and then again two weeks later, and see if we can detect spike-specific cells in breast milk. And we did this with what's called a tetramer, which is a way of tracking antigen-specific T cells where you take um, HLA molecules and you conjugate them to an epitope, which is a piece of that antigen, um, and then uh, you mix that with the T cells that you're studying, and if the T cells are specific to that epitope presented by that HLA molecule, they um, accumulate these tetramers, which have a fluorescent label, and then you can see that under a flow cytometer. So we did this with a couple of different tetramers because the tetramers you use have to match the HLA of the person that you're working with. We all have very different HLAs, so um, tetramers are not, uh, uh, they don't work on all people. You have to basically pick the tetramer that is, is specific to your person that you're working with. Um, and these are um, individual plots where we're looking at pre-third dose and post-third dose, and we're watching the expansion of these antigen-specific T cells following vaccination. So for example, in this person, we've gone from 0.4% of the breast milk cells before vaccine to now 4% of the breast milk T cells. These are CD8 T cells that are binding this one single spike epitope with a one single HLA restriction. So the magnitude of the response that we're seeing in the breast, in my opinion, is really amazing. So we compared it to what was happening in the peripheral blood, and yeah, you do see a little bit of expansion of clones, but in the breast milk, we saw this amazing expansion of spike-specific clones, really telling us that this mucosal site can respond rapidly to antigen recall, because it's already seeing antigen at this site. So we think this is interesting and relevant in the context of the mucosal biology that I'll tell you about in the female genital tract in terms of thinking about, can we monitor vaccine responses in these mucosal sites? So around the time that we were doing this project, I had um, a very talented undergraduate who um, came into my lab and wanted to start doing some biology, and her name was, is Quinn Peters. She's now a technician in my lab, and um, she had been working with these menstrual discs, and this is a picture of a menstrual disc. She was working um, with Chris Whidbey, who's a faculty member at Seattle U, to study um, enzyme production by lactobacillus in the female genital tract. And they were using these discs to collect um, cervical vaginal fluid, not during menstruation, so not so outside of menstruation, and then processing that for enzymes and doing a bunch of um, uh, enzyme work. So she came to our lab meeting and she presented on her undergraduate work, and we were all really excited about that. We thought this is so cool, um, and we thought, well, let's just start messing around with these and see what we can collect with them. So, like all good science, it starts with a willingness to experiment and, and fail. So for those of you who are not familiar with these products, so this is um, a firm plastic ring that has a very soft, flexible plastic cup, um, and it sits right over the cervix. So this is an example of where it's positioned. So some um, menstrual cups are designed to sit lower in the vagina. These pop right around the cervix. So they're, um, the ring is sitting in the fornices, and then the intention of this product is to, is to collect menstrual blood. So that's what it's designed for, is a, is a menstrual blood um, collection device. And the ones that we use are disposable. So there's a little bit of um, differential nomenclature that gets used. So people sometimes refer to this version as a menstrual cup, and these are silicone, and they're designed for reuse. Um, and then these products are single use, and sometimes they're referred to as discs, and sometimes they're referred to as disposable cups. 
So it's not exactly the same as the silicone version of this, but that's what the product is. Um, so we thought, well, I don't know, you're collecting all these cervical vaginal secretions, why don't we see what kind of cells we can get off? Maybe we can get some really interesting immune populations coming off of these discs. <clears throat> so that was our foray into female genital tract. So um, we just kept moving around um, and ended up here in this place that I think is extraordinarily interesting and very parallel to the work that we have been doing in the breast. So when we think about female genital tract, people often will divide it into upper and lower genital tract, where what they're really talking about is the cervix as the barrier. So in the upper genital tract, you're talking about um, the endometrium and the um, fallopian tubes, the ovaries. In the lower female genital tract, you're talking about this interface from sort of the end of the endocervix, the ectocervix, which is sitting right here, and then down through the vagina. So why would you do this? Why would you even think that this is remotely a good idea to be, to be sampling the space? Well, the space is extraordinarily important, and it's particularly relevant and important for HIV acquisition, for STI acquisition, for understanding what's happening in terms of the microbiome, in terms of thinking about bacterial vaginosis. So it's a site that's very important, and in the field of vaccine development, it's been like the last goalpost, right? So if you want to develop an HIV vaccine, you have to generate protection at that mucosal site. And it's extraordinarily difficult to do that. And you can't use peripheral blood as a proxy. So I think that's one thing that we've learned is that if you want to generate a mucosal response, you have to measure the mucosa. So how do you do that easily? So in terms of what's been done previously, so this is a speculum, which is basically a device that's inserted into the vagina so that you can visualize the cervix and know anatomically where you are. There are three major approaches that have been used in the literature to date. So the first is what's called um, cervical vaginal lavage, which is essentially where you um, take uh, this device, which contains saline, and you're washing the vagina. That's, a, that's the best way I can describe it, is you're squirting saline into the fornices across the cervix, and then you're pulling that fluid back, and you're basically hoping that you've washed out or collected that space, so all the cells that might be sitting in the fornices or in the vagina. Um, but, the, but this is happening in a supine position, so the patient is, um, is, on a, is on an exam table. It also requires this invasive procedure. The challenge with um, this uh, is that you get sort of unpredictable cell yields. You often get very low cell yields back when you use this approach. Um, the second approach that people will use is a cider brush or a spatula, which is the same device that's used during a pap smear, where this is a wire pokey brush that gets inserted into the endocervix and then is spun around. And then there's a spatula, which often is scraped across the top of the ectocervix. And that's used like to screen for HPV or to look for cervical dysplasia. But people have also used this as a way to collect cells. Um, this is an invasive procedure. You obviously couldn't do this in a pregnant person if you, want, if you were going to disrupt the cervix if you did that. Um, it also, people have shown that it preferentially seems to sample monocytic populations. So that's good if you want to know about monocytes and macrophages, less good if you want to know about T cells. And then I think it's also anatomically a different place. So, so a cytobrush is by definition, definition sampling the endocervical canal. That's what it's doing. And then the final approach that people will take is biopsy, which is obviously the most invasive of all of your options, where you're pinching off a piece of the tissue, and then you're um, grinding up that tissue and trying to extract the cells to be able to do your biology with that approach. All of these, by definition, are invasive. They require a healthcare provider. They require a speculum exam. It creates a very high barrier to participation when you're thinking about studies and how many people you can study. It also means that you're very limited in terms of the longitudinal kinds of studies you can do because um, by having manipulated the tissue, you've therefore changed the tissue. So now if you want to sample a week later, you're not sampling what was happening in that tissue without having disturbed it previously. So there's a desperate need to be able to sample this space in a low-cost, non-invasive way. Um, a lot of work, I want to recognize the work of, of my colleagues in Seattle. Um, this is a paper by Florian Kladek, and many people using all these different approaches, where a lot of them have been used in the HIV field to great success, um, and they each have pros and cons. So we said, well, I don't know, what about these menstrual discs? So this is to just show you what real biology looks like. So I always like taking, having these pictures from the lab because I feel like it really makes it very concrete. 
So these are the discs. So what we ask participants to do is to wear the disc for, they self-insert the disc, we explain how to do it. Um, they wear the discs for one to four hours, and we've found it doesn't really make that big of a difference between one and four hours, so it's really whatever is convenient for them. Um, and then we give them a 50 mil conical, and we just ask that they retrieve the disc and put it in the 50 mil, so 50 mil, mil conical, and then they give us the conical back. Um, this is the conical with, uh, um, with media added to it, and because um, these discs are coming out of vaginas, which are typically quite acidic, the media has changed color, so it's not red anymore, it's yellow, and that's because of the acidity of all the secretions that we've collected. Um, if you take those secretions and you put them on a microscope, I ho hopefully many of you can recognize um, immediately the problem if your interest is T-cells, which is that all of these are epithelial cells. So if you care about epithelial cells, like, please call me, because um, we have so many epithelial cells, like tons of epithelial cells. And this is the same problem we had in breast milk, which is loads of epithelial cells. So now we're trying to find the lymphocytes hidden amongst these epithelial cells. And if you can see these tiny little white bright star dots, those are the lymphocytes. So that's what we want to get out of the sample. Um, if you spin this down without doing anything to it, you end up with this massive cell pellet, um, very similar to the kinds of cell pellets we were getting out of our breast milk studies. So many of the similar challenges, except that I would say the challenges in this sample type are really even more than the samples that are present in breast milk, and that's because there's mucus. So in breast milk, there's not mucus, but in cervical vaginal secretions, it's full of mucin. Mucin is a wonderful protection. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful barrier, and it has many other functions, but it's really a problem if you want to try to get cells out of the sample. So the challenges that we encountered were a huge number of epithelial cells, many of which are dead, although they're not all dead. So if you want to culture epithelial cells, we can get you live epithelial cells. They all stick together. Epithelial cells are large, and they're sticky, so they make these big kind of clumpy masses. And then I um, alluded to all of the mucin that was there, and we could pull out the mucin and put it on a slide and look under the microscope and see that there were lymphocytes that were trapped in the mucin. So we really wanted to know how we were going to get those lymphocytes back out of that mucus. So after a lot of hard work um, on Quinn's part, she's an amazing scientist. She's currently applying to graduate school, so let me know if you would like um, to recruit her. She um, developed this protocol that works really well. So we basically take that disc, we repeatedly rinse it with media to wash off every single thing that we can get off of the disc, and then she takes the disc out, and she rinses it again, and then she puts it all back um, into one 50 ml conical. Uh, she spins it down, and then she adds DTT, which um, uh, breaks disulfide bonds, it's a thiol reducing agent, and that's what helps with the mucus the most. So that will dissolve the mucus and allow us to recover many more lymphocytes back. We strain the sample so that we can get rid of a bunch of the debris and the large clumping kind of um, uh, sticky parts that are here, um, and then spin it down. We have also found that once we have uh, a cell pellet that's a little bit more cleaned up, um, we can cryopreserve that cell pellet. And cryopreservation becomes really important in the context of thinking about larger trials or larger studies where you're not going to be able to do your flow cytometry on your fresh CVF sample that somebody just returned to you. You need to be able to freeze that sample, ship it from some other trial site, and then do your immunology in batches. So cryopreservation is, I think, a really important first step that we had to be able to demonstrate with this. Um, when we're ready to do our flow cytometry, we then thaw the samples, very similar to you would do with a, a peripheral blood sample. And then one really critical step that we found for just not making people insane on the flow cytometer is we have to get rid of the epithelial cells because, one, it takes forever to do the flow run because there's so many cells, and two, because they clog the cytometer. So the, the people in the flow core really get upset. Um, so we, we did a lot of experimentation thinking about uh, do we try to do epithelial, dead cell depletion, epithelial cell depletion? Do we try to do um, CD3 enrichment, CD45 enrichment? What we found works the best is CD45 enrichment, where CD45 is a pan leukocyte marker, so it'll mark anything that's a hematopoietic lineage cell. And we absolutely still get epithelial cells when we do this, but it just changes um, the fold enrichment of those cells of interest so that we can functionally do the flow cytometry assays. 
Um, you can also do the CD45 enrichment prior to cryopreservation, but it's just more time consuming because in the way that we have been processing these samples, we get one at a time, so then you gotta enrich it one at a time versus if you thaw them all and then do it, you can batch enrich, and that makes the whole process a bit faster. So this is an example of what our um, flow cytometry looks like off of these um, CVF samples collected in this manner. So the first thing we do, um, we always run it with a paired PBMC from the same person so that we have some kind of a reality check of the populations that we're looking at. And um, this is just looking at forward by side scatter where you have um, in PBMC a large lymphocyte population. And so you can identify that same lymphocyte population in the CVF. You can see there's a lot of other stuff in here that's not at lymphocytes, but this is at least a ratio that we can work with in terms of being able to do um, the flow cytometry work. If we don't cryopreserve, if we take the samples straight out of the person and put it right on, stain it and put it on the cytometer, we also see a large population of neutrophils, which is quite interesting. So if you're interested in neutrophil biology, there's a lot of neutrophils on these samples. Um, when we cryopreserve, those survive cryopreservation very poorly, and so we don't tend to recover them after cryopreservation. We then will set a CD45 by live gate, and that allows us to very quickly and easily identify just the live immune cells in this population. And you can see um, that it separates out really nicely here. So there's lots of things that are not alive, and there are lots of things that are not immune cells, but we can pretty easily and quickly identify the ones that we care about. We then um, will set a T cell, which is CD3 by CD19, which is a B cell gate, and you can see that we have um, both nice populations of T cells and B cells. So if you're a B cell biologist, there are lots of B cells in these samples. And then within the T cell population, we see both CD4s and CD8s. Um, the ratios do vary from person to person a bit, but they're pretty close to peripheral blood, meaning we get about two-thirds um, CD4 T cells and about one-third CD8 T cells. And then when we go into, for example, the CD4 T cell population, we can identify populations of uh, interest to us, meaning conventional T cells, which are these um, CD25 low T cells here. And then we can see populations like Tregs, regulatory T cells, which is this population of cells up here that are um, CD127 low, CD25 high. So if you really care about how you generate tolerance in the vagina when you're thinking about microbiome, um, and other microbial things, semen tolerance, all the things you need to be tolerant to, your Tregs are a really important population. So we wanted to know that we could study and isolate those Tregs. They're very enriched in the tissue or in the cervical vaginal fluid relative to their frequency in peripheral blood, which is not surprising. This has been well described across really all tissues. So then we, we were pretty excited about this, and we had been doing kind of one-off um, experiments to say, can we develop this protocol? Can we make this work? And then we thought, well, if we want to be able to sell this to anyone in the universe as a potential approach, we have to show it's reproducible. So the first person I talked to said, like, well, aren't you, just, it's kind of just garbage, right? Like, you're just collecting these cells that are being sloughed off from the tissues. So like, why do you think that's biologically important and irrelevant? Um, and so we wanted to be able to convince people that what we were sampling was meaningful, and so we were trying to think about the best way to do a reproducibility study. So the first idea we thought was, well, we think menstrual cycle might be important. So should we sample individuals on the same day, say day 10 of their menstrual cycle, and then do it across three different cycles? And that kind of made sense, but then we thought, well, that's a big assumption that their whole biology and T cell milieu and microbiome is not going to change across cycles, right? So what if they take antibiotics, or what if they get BV, or, you know, something else happens? So the best thing we came up with was the idea of sampling people for three consecutive days with the hypothesis that we know there's going to be small hormonal fluctuations that are happening, but they're relatively proximate in terms of the menstrual cycle. So we recruited five healthy reproductive age donors just from our workplace. This was a center, this is a workplace-based study. Um, we sampled them on day seven to 11 of the menstrual cycle with the exception of one individual who was on continuous birth control, so wasn't um, actively cycling, but therefore should have had very steady hormonal levels. We collected blood and then we collected CDF over these three, over these three sequential days using these menstrual discs. So this is post-menstruation. So no one is menstruating when this is happening. This is all we wait um, at least a day from cessation of last menstrual period before we would start sampling. The discs are worn for up to four hours and it's in the upright position because people are at work. 
So we give it to them when they get to work in the morning, they wear it, and then they return it to us like at lunchtime. Um, we picked day 7 to 11 because we felt like we would be beyond menstruation, but it was before we start to get into the big hormonal surges that are approximate to um, ovulation, and then before you get to have uh, big increases in progesterone during the luteal phase. So that's why we selected this window of time. We ran all of our samples on a 28-color T-cell focused panel that had been developed by our um, collaborator, Martin Prillick, who's at the Fred Hutch, who has done a lot of mucosal immunology in this space. Um, so targeting a lot of activation markers, a lot of exhaustion markers. I don't expect you to read this panel, but just to remember that um, it's mostly T-cell focused. So depending on how you like your data, um, this is the full complete data across these five individuals with these three replicates. Um, although they're not exactly replicates, right? So it's a bit of an assumption to think that your cervical vaginal secretions are gonna be the same volume day to day, that they're always gonna come out at some kind of a constant rate. I mean, that's, that doesn't really make sense for a biologic organism either, right? But we're thinking of them as replicates. Um, and if you first look at the composite data, if you look at the medians here, so we recover a median of 5,000 CD45 positive leukocytes, around 1,000 CD3s, um, we get CD4s and CD8s, and then about 1,000 um, uh, B cells. We also have this population that didn't make it here, which, which we are calling um, CD3 negative, CD19 negative, HLA DR positive, which means they're an antigen presenting cell of some kind. Um, this panel does not have a lot of antigen presenting cell markers in it, so I can tell you it's not a CD19 positive B cell, um, and it's not an activated T cell, which could also express HLA-DR. These mostly fall in the um, forward by side scatter of a monocyte, so we think they're probably monocytes, um, but there's definitely an antigen presenting population there. I think the other thing that you can appreciate um, from this is that there's variability day to day within the same individual. So you're not always gonna collect the same number of T cells or the same number of leukocytes when you do this. And that's really because it's a different, it's a person, right? So their behavior changes, the, the amount of secretions they have changes. Um, uh, so, so I think um, we have accepted the fact that the absolute number of T cells is not gonna be the same across replicates. So then the question we really wanted to ask was, what about the population structure? So if we go into those T cells and we say, well, what's the distribution of different populations? What does their exhaustion and activation marker profile look like? Can we do that with this, with this data? So when we started to look at that just at a very high level, we said, um, first of all, what kind of T cells are present in these samples? And again, we were looking at memory markers, so we're looking at um, central memory and effector memory. We're looking at naive T cells, so these are our naive T cells. We've flipped one of our markers from CD45 RO to RA, so it's like we've inverted our plot is the best way to think about that. So in these plots, your memory populations are now sitting at the bottom as opposed to sitting at the top, like the breast milk shows, uh, data I was showing you. Um, but what we find is that um, these are our central memory cells over here. Uh, sorry, these are our effective memory over here, the CCR7 negative. The CCR7 positive are um, our central memory. When we go into the CVS samples, both for the CD4 populations and for the CD8 populations, we find they're nearly exclusively memory populations. So it's very similar to what we observed in the breast, which is there are just not a lot of naive T cells that are present in these samples in either of these mucosal sites. Um, this population, which we call central memory in um, the peripheral blood, is really interesting in this space in the female reproductive tract, where by looking at the expression of these two markers, we will call them central memory, but there's a really nice um, uh, preprint paper um, by uh, Allison Swings Kohlmeyer, who shows that those are not the same as central memory. So, so they, their group calls this population migratory memory cells, meaning they have CCR7, so they can traffic between a lymph node and the tissue, but they're not the same as a central memory population that would be in peripheral blood. So we see those two. So this is a long way of saying we're recapitulating what others have shown in terms of this space. We also find that when we look across these five people, their distribution across these um, big populations of memory cells is very consistent across these three days. And they're not all the same. So we don't think that people are all gonna be the same, but we think that they should be the same as themselves across these three days. And that's really um, what we find when we look at memory populations. 
So then we said, but we have all these markers. We put a 28 color panel together. So how are we going to ask this question in multidimensional space? So how are we going to incorporate the expression of all these different markers and say, how well do people represent themselves over time? So this is a principal component analysis where we're basically saying um, reduce that high dimensional data and just show us the first two dimensions of that, um, of that high dimensional space as what we call principal component one and two, and then show us how our samples distribute across those two different dimensions. And these dimensions are, are composite dimensions. So if you're not familiar with this analysis, it might take a little bit of CCR5 and a little bit of CD103 and a little bit of things. So it's taking these um, the algorithm is taking weighted information from all your parameters and then making that data orthogonal and, co and combina combinatorial and orthogonal so that you can actually see it, essentially. Um, so we look at memory T cells. So we've gotten rid of the, uh, the naive T cells because that would not make sense if we did that analysis that would drive a huge difference. So these are only memory T cells. Um, what we can see is that peripheral blood is totally different than CVF. So T cells coming from peripheral blood and CVF, very different. This is not unexpected. This is what we think we're going to find. When we get rid of the peripheral blood and we say, well, just show us how people fall in this multidimensional space just for the CD3 T positive T cells, what we find is that people really look like themselves. So um, the reason we've taken out data points where we have less than 100 T cells, so that's why some people only get two dots here. But people sit. Um, very close to themselves and very far away from other people in this space. And we thought that was very reassuring in terms of thinking about this idea of reproducibility um, and also thinking about the fact that we're assuming biological variation in the T cell profile. And that's really important because there's a big literature about um, differential expression of CCR5, for example, as a mediator of HIV susceptibility. So we, we really don't expect that people are all going to look the same. We think they're going to look different, but we want them to look like themselves. And then when we dive just into the CD4 T cell population, we see that recapitulated again. So we're sampling in high dimensional space CD4 T cells, for example, from this person, which across those three days look pretty similar in terms of their population structure, in terms of all of these different markers together. So the next question we wanted to ask was, well, what's driving these people away from each other? So can we actually dig into um, the different markers that we've included in this panel and try to understand why some people are um, down here, why this person's down here, and why is this person all the way up here. So to do that, we took all of the T cells from all of these people, and we put them into a single computational space using um, this R package called Catalyst, uh, where um, we can now visualize and um, generate clusters of T cells that we're doing in an unbiased fashion to say how many different kinds of T cells are present in cervical vaginal fluid, and what are they, and how do they distribute across different individuals? So I show you this very zoomed out because I want to be—I want to show you the island that's sitting right here. So there's two big lobes. I think it looks like lungs. So um, here's the left lung and the right lung. It's not the lungs. And then this tiny little island that's sitting down here. If you want to look at that more closely, um, I've moved the island in terms of just where it spatially is distributing. So this is a UMAP projection. Again, it's a way to take high dimensional data and project it down. But compared to the PCA plot where each dot was a sample, now each dot is a cell. So we're looking at all the T cells from all the people in one space. So hopefully the first thing that's apparent to you is that there's two really big groups of cells, right? So. Um, these are CD8 T cells, and these are CD4 T cells. So they separate very clearly from each other in terms of large, big populations that are contributing here. All this analysis was done um, on Wednesday of this week by Mark Carlson. Um, I may or may not have moved my slides on the plane. Um, so there's lots of iterations, I think, that can happen as we move through this space and start to try to understand what it exactly, what, what have we done. Um, the island is really important, so don't forget about the island because we're going to come back to the island. So then we said, what are these eight clusters? This is always the first thing I want to understand is, well, you've just given me eight clusters, but what are they and can I name them with something that I understand, like some nomenclature that has some kind of biological meaning for me? Um, so if you look at the distribution of these eight clusters, what we find is that they 
are separated by degree of inflammation. That's the best way to think about them. So some of them are restricted to CD8, some of them are restricted to CD4s, but the most prominent feature that really separates the clusters from each other is, is their expression of inflammatory markers. Um, the other point that I will just make is that one fascinating thing that we have observed both when we hand gate, you know, we go through manually and set all of our gates for all of our T cells versus this more agnostic approach is that there's very strong correlation between ex so-called exhaustion markers on T cells and activation markers. So we see these populations of CD4 T cells that are co-expressing CCR5, which is a classic activation marker, and PD1, which is a classic exhaustion marker. And we find that's really interesting, um, and we don't totally know what that means. We're very interested in understanding that. When we start to try to parse what these different populations are, and this will be at a very high level, um, CD8 is sitting way over here. Um, so you can see that there are three of these that are really um, CD8 restricted. CD4 is over here. So for example, this population has no CD4 expression, but it does have some CD3 expression, or sorry, CD8 expression right here. These two populations, I think, are the most compelling. So these have high expression of CD103 and CD69, which tells us that these are tissue resident memory cells. So this is this population that I showed you first in breast milk. There are these cells that come um, and stay in the tissue, although we can clearly collect them now in the lumen of the tissue. And um, they're very potent effectors. And what's separating these two different clusters from each other is how activated they are. So one of them is very activated, one of them is slightly less activated. Um, this CD8 population uh, looks like um, it could be an effector-like population, although I always wonder if it's really CD8s. Um, because it has low expression of CD3, which is kind of curious. So this could be like an NK cell, and I think we need to think more about what that is. We see um, this population, which is very highly represented in our CD4s, but is also present in our um, CD8s. So uh, when we look at the expression of CD4 and CD8 in this population, both are contributing to this cluster. So this cluster is really being defined by its activation state more than it's being defined as being present in just CD4 or CD8. Um, it's a population that I put here as migratory or transitional because it includes both a CCR7 population, which means it's gonna be moving between the tissue, but it also includes markers of tissue residence. And so I think what's defining this cluster is a quiescent state. So it's not doing very much. This is a population that's not highly activated. It doesn't have high exhaustion marker expression. These guys at the very top are these exceptionally activated CD4 T cells. And what we see um, in these is that this very top one, which is a small, I made the font size how, we're, how much of the T cell population it's contributing to. That's why there's crazy differences, I should have said that. Um, so this is a small population. This is sitting in the island. This is the island. So this island is these crazy activated CD4 T cells that have incredibly high expression of both activation and exhaustion markers on them. And then this C7 population is like that, but slightly less activated. So they're, they're sitting at the very tip of these. And I'll show you them again. These two populations I'm not actually convinced are T cells. So I think we need to go back and say, like, did they slip in through our gating scheme? Do we need to be more careful about our gating as we move into this computational space? Because they're not really looking like they're T cells. So then when we go back to the mapping that I showed you before in terms of the distribution of these cells at the single cell level, what you see begins to sort of make some sense. So um, in our CD8 cluster, at the very bottom of the lobe, we have these very highly activated TRMs. And then just above that, we have this population of um, less activated TRMs. And then we have this population of CD8 T cells that don't have strong TRM-like features. So we call them kind of these, these effector memory-like cells that are sitting here. And then over here in our CD4 population, by and large, we see a population of kind of quiescent cells. So they're not doing a whole lot, um, at least not at this exact moment. So they're sort of, um, they're sort of phenotypically quiet. That's the big purple blob. And then um, the slightly activated T cells in this blob are these orange ones sitting here. And then the exceptionally highly activated ones are sitting like way down off the end of this plot because they're so phenotypically different than the other cells here. So then the next thing we kind of wanted to understand was, well, how are those populations and those markers now distributed across our subjects or our participants? So if we go to each of our participants, 
is this differential clustering and distribution of clusters um, responsible for why participants are sitting in, in these different spaces and, and how is that being defined? So when we look at the distribution of these phenotypic markers by cluster, or by patient, sorry, by participant, let's just use participant, what we find is that mostly people, again, sit with each other, which makes a lot of sense. So these are two different approaches. One is the PCA, one is this catalyst package, but it's giving us the same information, which is that people tend to cluster with themselves in terms of the distribution of these different markers that we're using um, to generate, uh, for example, these PCA plots. Um, you can see, like, this person here who's participant two is sitting in a very anti-inflammatory state. So um, they're not making, a, their T cells do not have high expression of inflammatory markers. They don't have high expression of these um, exhaustion markers. And as you move up across this plot, you are um, seeing individuals accumulate more and more inflammation, essentially. So when we get up here to this person up here, the two samples that they're contributing, they have exceptionally high expression of these different inflammatory and exhaustion markers. These two people look very similar, so you can see that they got kind of intermixed. Um, that's basically what I said. So then to just orient you to who these people are across the two plots. So this person who is um, in a more inflammatory state is this person here on this PCA plot. And then by comparison, um, this person who's really in a very quiescent state, a very quiet um, state from an inflammatory perspective, um, is this person over here in the PCA plot. So they're separating quite nicely from each other using both of these approaches. I can't remember, but it's an answerable question. So then when we look at the, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and we can definitely figure it out. Um, and then when we look at people um, in terms of the distribution of these populations uh, by time, so we're looking at the sampling from uh, their, their um, put together in sequential order of when we sampled the person, um, you can see this big sort of quiescent purple population and then um, at the bottom, we're seeing this um, inflammatory CD4 population. And the inflammatory CD4 population is really interesting from um, a biologic perspective because these are what people refer to as HIV target cells. So they have high expression of CCR5, which in addition to being an inflammatory marker is also an HIV co-receptor. Um, and there is an association in the literature between dysbiosis or having a diverse vaginal microbiome and increased expression of, um, increased recruitment of target cells which express CCR5 as a potential mediator of HIV infection. So, or HIV susceptibility, I should say. So we, we are um, interested in this population because uh, of these associations with HIV. So then um, the last thing that we wanted to do in these particular analyses, and I'm um, almost finished here, was to look at specific populations that we know that the literature cares about. So the literature cares a ton about um, CD4 T regs because they're important in tolerance. Um, people are interested in these migratory populations, which are these CCR7 positive CD4 populations that can um, move between the tissue and the regional lymph nodes. Um, and they're interested in uh, the activation and suppressive state of those CD4 populations. So what we were trying to do is basically say, we can sample the same populations that you care about in your tissue sample. So we know if you're doing a cervical biopsy, you really want to know about the Tregs. And the short story is the Tregs that we recover using this approach are very similar phenotypically to what people have published um, in the literature previously in terms of the expression of these activation um, and uh, exhaustion markers. So again, looking at PD-1 and CCR5 kind of as an example of that and finding that people very closely match themselves over time. So to give you a really um, kind of concrete example, for example, this person, participant 2, has very low expression of PD-1 on their Tregs all the time, but this person over here, participant 5, um, has very high expression of, of PD-1 on my T-Rex. So then when we kind of dove into this, and again, this was really to demonstrate that what we were finding matched what had been reported in the literature, we find um, this, uh, these T-Reg populations that have 
really high expression of all of these what are called exhaustion markers, which means they're chronically seeing antigen. These are markers that cells upregulate when they're seeing antigen all the time. Um, and those include things like ICOS, PD-1, LAG-3, CTLA-4, and TIM-3. And then just to really emphasize the point, but they also have a lot of CCR5, which is this kind of HIV co-receptor inflammatory marker. So we're very intrigued by this um, co-expression of these um, molecules, and they're interested in trying to understand what that population is doing. Our CD8 T cells also do that, which we think is very interesting. So they also have high expression of PD-1 on them, excuse me, um, PD-1 on them, but they are also making um, granzyme. They're making, they have a lot of CCR5 on them, and then they have high expression of HLA-DR, which in this context is really a marker of activation is what we're seeing there. So um, hopefully what you've heard is that this is a really important site to study because it's um, critical for HIV and STI acquisition and susceptibility. Sampling this area is very difficult because it's, um, the methods that have been used to date are invasive and that creates a high barrier to participation and it also prohibits really long longitudinal sampling across people. Um, these menstrual discs are a potential avenue to non-invasively collect samples that would study a very similar populations of cells um, but could be used um, without a healthcare provider, without um, a speculum exam. They're very low cost, so they're like, I don't know, 25 or 50 cents in terms of thinking about the implications for doing a large clinical trial or a large study, but the, the relative cost of using this approach is astronomically lower than the alternative. And then it also allows for longitudinal sampling because you're not manipulating the tissue when you collect the samples in this manner. I will say that um, we think that what we're collecting is roughly representative of tissue. We would like to know better where exactly we are, so we think it's mostly cervical because of the positioning of the disc, but that's kind of one outstanding question for us. We also think that um, luminal T cells may be biologically distinct from tissue. So I don't think the only value in collecting these cells is because you're trying to save yourself a biopsy. I also think that luminal T cells, there's some accumulating literature that they um, can be, they can enter the lumen of the tissue, of the, yeah, they can enter the lumen and then they're capable of still going back into the tissue and trafficking through a regional lymph node. So um, they're independently interesting, even uh, separate from their ability to recapitulate what's happening in the tissue. We can collect large numbers of these leukocytes, um, including T and B cells. If you care about neutrophils and APCs, there's a way to do that too. Um, and they can be cryopreserved. And we get about 70% recovery after cryopreservation. So if you wanted every single cell there, you should do it fresh. Um, but you still get a reasonable number of cells back after you cryopreserve. The T cell population, although the absolute number of T cells that you collect is variable across days, the distribution of populations within that sample is relatively consistent across those dates, which really was kind of our first goal, was to be able to demonstrate that. And then people look different. So not all people have the same population structure, even in these five individuals that we sampled for this very small study. So in terms of where we're thinking this has potential future use, um, we're very interested in understanding whether it can be used longitudinally across the menstrual cycle to be able to understand um, different kinetics within these populations. So are there T cells that are pulled into the lumen um, during different phases of the menstrual cycle? Thinking about the microbiome and the um, microbial community state as a potential mediator of different T cell populations that are present and then individual behaviors. Um, we are really interested in this in the context of pregnant people where you can't sample the space during pregnancy because you can't do a cytobrush and a pregnant person will disrupt the, endo, um, the endocervical canal, like you would, you would never do that. And so can we use this as a totally non-invasive way to sample what's happening, say, um, mid-gestation and during late gestation, collect a lot of information about the epithelial cells, the microbiome, um, the cytokines that are present, all the immune cells, and then think about uh, using that as a predictor of preterm birth. We're, of course, interested in HIV and STI susceptibility. We're independently interested in mucosal immunity and vaccine responses. We're thinking about could you use this as a way to detect clearance of HPV? So if you have a bunch of people who have high-risk HPV, would this be a way to um, collect samples more easily to say, did they clear their HPV? Um, and then finally, um, in 
uh, one last kind of thought we've been having is, well, could you collect enough epithelial cells, which so far we've been throwing in the garbage, and actually um, ask some really interesting questions about your ability to, for example, detect um, transformation of cells in, in these products um, that are coming off of these disks. Uh, this is my lab in its current state. The project was um, really entirely led by Quinn Peters, who I mentioned to you, and then Mark Carlson, who is in the computational um, biology group at Seattle Children's, who has been a fantastic partner for us. Um, Martin Prillick is a mucosal T cell biologist at the Hutch, and Ava is a postdoc in his lab who um, helped train Quinn on running um, this high parameter T cell panel. Um, Heather Jaspin uh, has collaborated with us for a long time in a variety of our studies and um, also contributed to this project uh, in the context of thinking about how do we process this difficult to use sample and how do we correctly set our gates and identify populations of cells because the forward and side scatter look completely different. So the first time we did this, um, Quinn ran it without a PBMC and our, our voltages were completely wrong because the distribution of cells looks so different. Um, Mel and Sim um, helped with those projects and with thinking about 16S sequencing, which um, we have data for three of these people, so in terms of thinking about microbiome. Um, Chris Whitby was uh, Quinn's PI who really first thought about using these as a way to sample um, for enzyme production and then taught us how to do it. And then Paul Edelson is a statistician who's been helping us at the Hutch. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions.